out by making room for our neighbors. If you have an empty seat next to you, do you want to just like maybe push into the middle a little bit? Can you do that now? Everyone, come on, stand up. It's good exercise. It's all the exercise you're going to get this week. Let's go. Stand up, move into the middle. Excellent. Yeah. Well, we're making room at the ends for all the people coming in. Excellent. Thank you guys for doing that. Brilliant. Well, welcome to DrupalCon Barcelona. My name is Holly Ross. I'm the executive director of the Drupal Association, and I am really thrilled to be here. If we could have our slides, that would be awesome. Ta-da. All right. So welcome back to Barcelona is what I should say. How many of you were here in 2007? Lots of you. Excellent. Good. Well, when we were here in 2007, there were about 400 people at DrupalCon Barcelona. Uh, and in 2015, there's about 2,000 of you. It's a very big change. Uh, but it's not just the cons that have changed in all of that time in the last eight years. And I wanted to hear about all the things that had been going on in Drupal since 2007. So I asked you on Twitter, what's changed in the last eight years? And what we learned is that the technology has changed. 2007, first iPhone came out, right? Um, we're glad that some of that technology has changed. This is from Dries's keynote in 2007. We suck at Flash. Anyone concerned about that today? No? Oh. <laughs> All right. Uh, we also learned that uh, some of the technology has not changed. Larry Garfield reminded us that back in 2007, he was talking about the new PHP 5, right? Here we are. <laughs> um, we also, of course, uh, found out that um, our infrastructure, like how we work together as a community, has changed significantly in the last eight years. Uh, back in 2007, if you wanted to test something uh, in Drupal Core, you asked Angie, and according to Angie, she went beep boop, beep boop, beep boop, and then it was tested. <laughs> but now, uh, we have all kinds of amazing test bots managed by our volunteers and the association staff uh, that help keep the project going forward. Uh, DrupalCon Barcelona gave rise to some of our community's most infamous or famous people, depending on <laughs> how you want to talk about it. Uh, so uh, lots of people got to come out of their shells and become butterflies. Um, and, uh, the, you know, of course, the project itself has changed a bunch, too. Since 2007, the project has become giant. And not just Core itself, but the thousands and thousands of contrib modules and distros and themes that make up uh, the work that we do on Drupal. So, um, of course, uh, other things don't change about our technology uh, at the cons, <clears throat> if you've tried to get on the Wi-Fi this morning. Uh, we also... Um, you know, have seen that since 2007, some amazing uh, companies have been born. A whole ecosystem of companies have been born around Drupal that are creating all kinds of economies. Thousands of jobs have been created. Families have been created since 2007. I don't know if you guys remember uh, Merlin of Chaos there, his family. And our Drupal family has been created. I love this one from Wim. This is my favorite. It's pretty amazing. So lots has grown in Drupal. Uh, including, of course, the number of people that are helping to make Drupal. So back in 2007, we had about 830 patch writers for Drupal, what was it, 6 back then? Yeah. And uh, Drupal 8 has over 3,000 contributors today, which is pretty amazing. So congratulations to you guys. That's really, really big. Um, and all of this has been leading, you know, you guys have been making all this change happen, which has been pretty, pretty remarkable to see. One of the things that you guys have been doing to help get Drupal 8 out the door, in addition to all the technical stuff, uh, is helping to uh, help fund the work to close those last few uh, critical issues, the release blockers, and help get Drupal 8 out the door. And we asked you to help us make that happen by raising 250,000 US dollars uh, to fund some of this work. Uh, and we are really thrilled to share that uh, thanks to a generous donation from the Drupal Dev Days that just happened in Montpellier. And Leon, are you here? No? Oh, Leon? No? I can't see hands very well. Well, I want to thank the folks uh, from, who were involved with Drupal Dev Days Montpellier for helping to make a, a donation from their event. 
um, our partners at Appnovation Technologies, uh, and overnight we just got another donation from uh, Drupal Camp Colorado, Colorado. Uh, and now our total is, look at that. Look at that. And Colorado just came in overnight with another couple hundred dollars. So we are less than $750 away from fully funding a Drupal 8 release, which is pretty amazing. So thank you all so much for the contributions, the hundreds and hundreds of individual contributions, along with the companies who've helped make this happen. Thank you for, for helping us reach this goal. And we hope that you'll help us put, over, put us over the top uh, here at this event and we can finish the campaign out. So thank you and give yourself a round of applause, please. That was a really big deal that we did that. Um, and of course, it's all in service of Drupal 8. We're getting really close. We hope we'll have some news at this con. That would be very nice to share. Um, and I just thank you for letting the association be part of the ride with that community. We've done, um, uh, we've, we've learned so much from the people that we, we work with when, in the community every day. And we're really proud that we can partner with you to make Drupal happen in all the ways that we do. So thank you for that. Now, I don't know how many folks have had a chance to uh, ever meet uh, Aaron Winborn. Uh, but Aaron Winborn was a prolific Drupal contributor and a really remarkable human being who helped make many people feel, feel very welcome and find their way in the Drupal community. Uh, and he was diagnosed with ALS a few years ago, and just this spring, he passed away. But he epitomized what makes Drupal so amazing. Uh, I mean, he was a great coder, but what, we, what he really was was a fantastic human. Uh, and it's his contribution to the community that really inspired the community working group of Drupal to put together an award to celebrate Aaron's life. So over the spring and through the summer, they took nominations of community members um, uh, who represented the kind of ideals that Aaron represented. Uh, these are some of the folks that were, were nominated. Um, and they put together an award uh, of a one of a DrupalCon, a DrupalCon sponsorship, uh, allowing one person to come to a DrupalCon uh, every year in Aaron's honor. So this is our first award, and on behalf of the community working group, um, I hope that everyone will join me in thanking uh, them and applauding our very first awardee, Miss Kathy Thays. So, Kathy um, has been an amazing member of the community. Uh, how many of you guys know Kathy? All right. If you don't know Kathy yet, you're about to, uh, because Kathy has been organizing sprints for years. But one of the things that she's uh, most famous for is helping people get involved in Drupal, no matter where they're at. I can personally attest to it, because she sat next to me in Amsterdam for an hour trying to help me memorize Git commands. <laughs> Um, and they lasted a whole week. <laughs> you want to do it with me again? Uh, right now? No. <laughs> <laughs> but Kathy, thank you for all you do. And you want to share any thoughts? Uh, thank you. It's really an honor. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. <laughs> awesome. All right. And. In addition to our amazing uh, community members, uh, individual community members, like I mentioned, there's a whole business ecosystem around Drupal and now, and they do a ton to help support uh, the work that Drupal does uh, through the association and directly as well. So I just want to take a moment to thank all the people who help fund things like test spots and localize.drupal.org uh, and sprints and camps all over the country, all over the world. Um, main header. That's a good typo. Um, <laughs> I try, but I gotta have one in every presentation, right? All right. Uh, so we have, uh, of course, all the sponsors who help us get here. Going from 400 to 2,000 people is no small move, um, and these folks help make this event, uh, you know, run as smoothly as it does. Um, let's get into some of the logistics because this con, we want it to go very smoothly for you, so I want to share some of those words with you. Um, and also just remember that you'll get into it what you put out of it this week. So go in and you know, do everything, meet everyone, and have a great time. And here's some of the ways that you can do that. 
the first here is, as Jam mentioned uh, earlier, we're going to have a group photo. It's what we do at every con. So after the Dries note today, we're going to ask you to exit out through these doors, down the escalators, and out into the uh, courtyard area um, in front of registration, uh, where we'll take our group photo. So head on outside soon after the keynote to make sure that that happens. And then you can have fun trying to find yourself later. A uh, couple words about the Wi-Fi here. Uh, here is the network and the password. Uh, you may have noticed we've been having some trouble with the Wi-Fi, so uh, you know, please be patient with us. Um, we have some outside network issues um, that are affecting what's happening inside the building, so hold tight with us. Everyone's working on it. If you do find that uh, service is disconnecting, anyone in a white t-shirt with the Barcelona logo on it is staff. Um, they can help alert folks uh, and get the guy that we, ca we call Wi-Fi Will uh, to run over and see what we can do. So we're working on it the best we can and we're really sorry uh, for any disruptions that it causes. But nobody has any live demos in their presentations, right? Nobody did that? Okay. All right. After Wi-Fi, you care about coffee. So here's where to get it. Uh, free coffee in the back of the exhibit hall will be available for the morning breaks. That's right after our photo today. Uh, and paid coffee will be available throughout the day back there in the exhibit hall. So you can always go get a cup of coffee there. Your meals today will also be in that exhibit hall. A uh, couple of notes, if you, are, if you have a special meal, uh, you have special stations for yourself there um, on the right-hand side of the buffet. Uh, so if you are vegan, kosher, or halal, that's you know, where your things will be. Um, don't eat the vegan meals if you're not vegan, because we don't want them to starve. Uh, and if you have a kosher or a halal meal, do ask a waiter for your meal uh, so that they can get that to you in the appropriate manner. All right, social media at the con. Lots of things here. This is how to get connected and share what's happening with the outside world. Uh, important for today in particular, during Dries' keynote, the hashtag is DriesNote. Uh, that's also where you're going to want to send any questions so that the excellent Mike Anello can help field those following uh, the Dries note and the Q&A that we have. All right, a couple of schedule uh, changes today. Uh, we have a change in the core conversations track. So we'll now have Drupal 8 and media status updates uh, by Yana. So it'll be 1 o'clock uh, or 1300 in, in the core conversations room. Uh, and for BOFs, uh, if you were interested in scheduling a birds of a feather session, that's offline now. So you'll need to write that up on the boards in the hallway. Um, and there's still a little bit of space available there. OK. Uh, as Jam, if you, anyone catch the pre-note this morning? Anyone? You guys were all here. Try again. Okay, thanks, Jam. <laughs> I'm glad you caught it. <laughs> all right. So code of conduct, as Jam reminded us, is sort of the thing that holds this community uh, together. Uh, if you have an issue while you're at the con, you're going to want to contact Adam Hill. Um, there's his contact information. Or Mateo, our local contact. Or Donna. Adam and Donna are on our community working group. So if you have any issues, please let us know. But just remember, everyone here deserves a great con, so let's try to keep it that way. Trivia night. That is a great social event you don't want to miss. Even if you're new to Drupal, come learn about Drupal at Trivia Night. Uh, so doors open at 2100. Um, this is the venue and the address. It's also available on the site. It's a bit of a hike. Thursday, not Wednesday. Second, typo number two. Come to Trivia Night on Thursday, not Wednesday. Good job, me. All right. How about women in Drupal? Is that tonight? Yes. I got one right. That's tonight. Uh, so come at 6 o'clock. It's at the Bamboo Beach Bar, not too far. A little map about how to get there, and you can also find that up on the site. And we definitely want to celebrate the best of Barcelona while we're here. Uh, and as you know, DrupalCons are a team experience. Uh, so we put those on with an amazing set of volunteers every year, including Pedro and Cristina from he here. Well, welcome everyone to Barcelona. Um, we've prepared a welcome party tonight at 8 p.m. There will be live music, lots of fun, and hopefully most of us. Well, or maybe hopefully not, because we are a lot. Um, <laughs> so it's 8 p.m. Be puntual, Spanish style, OK? <laughs> and if you want free tickets, just come to the Spanish Association uh, uh, booth in the exhibit hall. 
and first come, first serve. There are not a lot of them. Thank you guys and thanks for all your work in helping to put this together. All right, you also don't want to go to those parties without looking like a true Drupaler. I went for a walk last night. I saw a lot of you jogging in your Drupal gear. That was fun. Uh, if you need more teas while you're here, sweatshirts, something for your dog or your baby. If your dog is your baby, you could do that too. Um, there are, you can find, they don't have any cat onesies though, just for dogs. I was upset. But you can go to the Drupal store in the exhibit hall um, and stock up there. Uh, sprints. Sprints. Lots of chances to sprint here uh, this week. Um, and one of the most amazing things is whether you have been a longtime code contribu contributor or if you've never contributed before, we're going to help you get started. So come to the sprints, especially Friday. All this information is available on the site as well, but we hope you'll join us. Uh, for the Friday sprints in particular, please keep your badges. You may have noticed that security really cares about that. So don't lose your badge and have that on Friday. Uh, and now I would like to turn things over to one of our most long-standing partners uh, to help introduce what you're all waiting for. Uh, so help me welcome to the stage, please, Yane from Exov. Hi, everybody. I just donated that it's now 250,000 euros and 79 cents. So consider that done. You know what? Drupal 8 is closer than ever. And we made a fancy game to celebrate the long, long, long march together. You can see here a Drupal bird flying through the frozen versions of Drupal. to the golden age and beyond. So if you want to play, see whether you are worth of it, you go to drupalbird.com. And this is what it should look like. So fly past the frozen versions, not hit them, and then you get the golden age and profit. And yesterday, when we had the first people on the stand, it looked like this. And, and people were standing there with their mobile phones. But, you will master it by practicing, I can guarantee that. So, when you have played, come to our booth, number 300, to claim your prize. If you play the game, but you don't succeed to aid, there will be some of you, you will get the great player sticker. And then, if you manage to get to the level 8 or more, 17 is current, current record, you will get the boss player sticker. Both of these are limited. We have printed 300 boss players and 600 great player stickers. And when they run out, there won't be no more. <laughs> and then we will have a t-shirt sweepstake every day that everybody that has played on that day will have the option to get this fancy t-shirt. There will be only three of them. We pro probably need to shred the others because we have some, some sizes. <laughs> so, you find the game at drupalbird.com. But try not to play too much during the keynote. That if the people are nodding there, looking a bit angry, then they are not agreeing with Dries, but they are playing the game. That's it. Now I want to introduce a man 
that doesn't need introdu introductions is the reason why we are here. The primary person behind Drupal and the man who scored six points in Drupal Bird. <laughs> Please join me welcoming Dries Bodat. Thank you. Is my mic on? It is. So I actually did try Drupal Birds, and I don't think I got past, you know, three. Um, so I have to do some more practicing. Um, all right. Welcome, everybody, to, um, to Barcelona. Um, I did something a little bit special. You saw me fiddle with my slides. Um, so normally I make my slides in Keynote. This time I made them in slides.com, which is nice because it's HTML and CSS and JavaScript, right? And so you should be able to follow along on the, you know, if you go to this URL. For those maybe not in the audience that are, you know, watching the, um, the video cast, you can follow the slides. Um, all right. So how many of you struggle with work-life balance? I definitely do. You know, you, you remember those, those days or those nights where, you know, you're working on a project for work or maybe you're working on Drupal 8. And in doing so, you're kind of ignoring your partner. You know, he or she doesn't get the time, the quality time that, you know, they deserve. And over time, that starts to build up, right? And you know that tension in the back of your mind. Like, you know it's going to go wrong. But you keep working on your project. Um, but at some point, obviously, you've crossed that threshold. And he or she will basically be, um, you know, we need to talk. Um, let, let me get my clicker working here. Um, we need to talk. And so you do talk about these things. And once you're done talking, it actually, you know, clear, clears the air. Like, you know, you agree to make some changes. And by implementing those changes, uh, you basically feel better. You have a path forward. And so I think this is just one example, maybe an example that we can relate to. Um, but I do think it is true, um, you know, for many things in life. And so sometimes it's better to um, actually talk about the things that are in the back of our minds instead of not talking about them. And so in this keynote, I wanted to do something a little different. And, you know, instead of talking about all the things that are great and all the great things we've done, I wanted to talk about some of the things that are, you know, that keeps people up or that are in the back of people's minds. And hopefully by doing so, um, you know, we'll feel better, right? All right, and so basically, um, in talking to a lot of people, and I do talk to a lot of people, there's all these like sort of uncomfortable questions. And so I made a list of those. And I think one that I think is on a lot of people's mind is, you know, what is, you know, is Drupal losing momentum? You know, some companies, they're not doing as well as they used to do. You know, my phone isn't ringing off the hook anymore. And so what's going on? And so we need to talk about that. Um, you know, why can't we release Drupal 8 on time? You know, it's been three years since we decided to start releasing Drupal 8. And we haven't released it yet. Maybe we should talk about that too. A lot of people that I to talk to, they're also nervous about other players in the market. They'll say, wow, WordPress is growing so fast. It makes me a little nervous. Or, you know, Squarespace has evolved from maybe just an end user tool to having better developer APIs. Or so many of the large proprietary competitors have more features. What are we doing there? Uh, and, and, and what about the emerging new platforms that are basically focused on just providing APIs? Right? There's a series of these as well. And so lots of questions um, that I get, at least, about how we as Drupal can compete uh, in that market. And so we need to talk about that as well. Um, the other thing is usability. Um, I think Angie has a presentation, I think it's on Thursday, um, about some of the results of the usability study that we did in Minnesota. We do on, you know, on a regular basis. I think this was the third version. And there's still a lot of things 
basic things that people re report to us. And so why is it so hard to get some of these basic usability things right? So we need to talk about that as well. All right, here's another one. A lot of people that I talk to, um, you know, they look at these client-side apps, Backbone, Ember, Angular, GS, and they see them emerging. Maybe they're dabbling a little bit with them. Maybe they feel like they're cheating on Drupal uh, by doing that. And so it's also a thing. And you know, I want to spend some time uh, talking about that as well. All right. All right. So. All these questions I would like to address in this keynote, uh, at least to some uh, depth. And then I, I roughly organized them in these three buckets. I think some of them are related to our development process, some of them are related to our position in the market, and some of them are more technical and you know, about the relevance as a, as a technical platform. So let's talk about all of them, and let's start with the first one. Because um, clearly we have a lot of things to talk about. <laughs> Um, the first one is, is Drupal losing momentum? And I think the answer is yes. We have lost a lot of momentum. But in talking to a lot of people, it's very clear that almost all of them are waiting for Drupal 8. Right? And in fact, this is a known phenomenon. This is not unusual. There is, in fact, a name for this thing, which is called the Osborne effect. And the name actually came from, I think his name was Adam Osborne. And this was in the 80s. He ran a technology company that was creating personal computers. And so they had the Osborne 1 at the time. And then they went on to announce the next version of the Osborne 1. And the fact that they announced that the next version of the Osborne 1 came, you know, was on the horizon, basically stopped all sales and the company went bankrupt. Right? And I think. I think we also know it from maybe in our personal lives from you know, buying a phone. Maybe it's an iPhone, maybe it's another phone. But if you know that there's going to be a new iPhone in three months or in one, one month, you're not, probably not going to buy an iPhone. And in fact, Microsoft suffered from this as well. And I think, I don't know the exact details because I'm not a Microsoft user, but they had a, they had a, a really bad situation with this too, where that one version of uh, the Windows phone and uh, not only was there a new version coming out, but also they said that the next version will not be compatible with the previous version. And so it made it even worse, so they couldn't actually just upgrade the software. And so this is exactly what's happening with Drupal as well. And this has happened in the past too. Maybe it's been so long ago that we don't remember, but if you look at what happened with Drupal 6, roughly, um, you know, six months or more before Drupal 7 was released, we saw a, a real drop, a 30% drop almost in adoption. So we've seen this before. But what we've also seen is that once that major release comes out, there is a huge spike. And so I'm very confident that we will see a similar spike once Drupal 8 comes out. And historically, you know, Drupal adoption has roughly doubled with every major release. And so, yes, maybe we're losing some business right now because our customers, our users, are waiting for Drupal 8. But once we get Drupal 8 released, you should expect things to pick up very rapidly. And so what we really have to do here is get Drupal 8 released. I mean, of course, that isn't anything new. Um, but there's a lot of different ways to help. You can donate money. You know, thank you for pushing us over that, that uh, you know, that limit, or not limit, but that a goal. <laughs> um, but I think the most important thing you can do actually today is to start building our websites on Drupal 8. Even though we haven't released Drupal 8 yet, for a certain type of project, you can start building today. Projects that don't need contributed modules, projects that won't release, you, have, you don't have to um, run them in production quite yet. Some of these projects take a few months to develop. And it's pretty safe to do the development on Drupal 8. I'm not saying you should run them in production, but you can start building them in Drupal 8. And in building them, you find critical bugs, you can help port modules and do all of these things. And this is what will help the ecosystem advance. All right. 
So we've actually come a pretty long way. Uh, Holly already shared some of these statistics, but if you look at the history of Drupal 8, we accepted patches from more than 3,000 different contributors. That's a lot of people. That's more people than are in this room, right? And in, and in fact, we accepted over 15,000 patches. Last year in Amsterdam, that number was around 11,000. So in just one year, we've added, you know, we've, we've accepted more than 4,000 new patches. We fixed 1,300 criticals in the process. That's, that's a big number too. And probably the most exciting two stats are the, the two at the bottom. So for one month, we've not seen any surprises. You know, when we manage the criticals, you know, the release, blocker, uh, the, the release blocking bugs, we haven't seen anything that surprised us in a month. And what that means is that, you know, we're getting more and more stable and that things are getting more and more predictable. Um, and also there's only one real problem left. And so if you, if you actually go to the critical issue queue, you may actually get a different perception because you may remember that a week or two weeks ago we hit an all-time low of three remaining critical bugs. And if you were to look today, it's probably at 18 or 19 critical bugs. It's a little bit misleading because what we've done is we've taken one of those critical bugs and we split it out in smaller critical bugs. So the total amount of work is actually the same, it's just that the way we choose to organize it is in making smaller critical bugs for everything that was in that one critical bug. And so really we've never been closer um, to, to release and we've never felt better about um, the kind of bugs that come in and that get reported. And so as a result, um, we've decided to make a first release candidate available on October 7th. Yeah. I think that's very exciting. The caveat though is that, you know, while we feel really good about the bugs that come in, and the fact that there's no surprise criticals, um, you know, of course, you never know, and we may find a security bug or a severe data loss issue that would cause a change in, um, in, this, in this date. But we haven't found any of those in one month. So we're feeling pretty good about not finding any more. But you never know. Um, so I think that's exciting. Um, it means we're only about two weeks away, I think, uh, from having the first RC. Um, and we're going into that with a lot of stability. So, however, um, you know, some things sort of need to change too, right? It, the process to get there was incredibly hard. Um, in fact, it took us almost three years since we first announced feature freeze to where we are today. Last year in Amsterdam, we rolled the first beta. Now, a year later, we're still not our, at RC. And in fact, if you think about it, Drupal is 15 years old. Almost, almost 15 years old. And almost five years of Drupal's life we've spent on Drupal 8. It's kind of crazy, you know? It's a third of our life we've spent on working on Drupal 8. And so it's not very healthy for a release to take that long. So. So why can't we release on time? First of all, I wanna say that no one is to blame for this. You know, I think it's not because we don't work hard. It's not because we're not smart. In fact, I think Drupal is one of the hardest working and smartest people uh, that I've ever seen. And you know, many people have worked days and nights and weekends and probably gave up a lot of that work-life balance you know, traveled around the world even to get Drupal 8 released. And so a lot of people have done incredible things, so no one is to blame for this, except, you know, maybe me, for not seeing this problem earlier, for not making some changes earlier. Um, but I think the lesson here is that, you know, it's not about people, it's not about us, it's really about the process. We've, we've been working the wrong way. And so here's how I'd like to explain how we've worked. So if you think about how we think about building a feature in Drupal, 
we roughly plan it out. We say this feature we're going to split in smaller steps. You know, each of these steps is going to be a patch. And that patch is going to get committed, and we do that in seven steps or four steps or however many steps. But in reality, as you all know, things work a little bit different. <laughs> each of these steps takes maybe a little bit longer. There is things that we didn't predict that need to happen as well. Um, sometimes people disappear. You know, things happen in their life. Um, they lose interest. They have to focus on something else. So they move away from Drupal, either permanently or temporarily. And so the work is then left behind. And we lose a lot of time when that happens because then somebody else needs to step in and pick up that work. And so reality um, always takes a little bit longer. And you know, this is nothing new. I think a lot of us in our daily lives, working for agencies, uh, you know, we see it as planning is really hard. And humans are actually really bad at any kind of planning. And so it's called the planning uh, fallacy. Um, you can go read about it, but I think Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson put it really well. Um, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. <laughs> uh, and so that's exactly what happens with every feature that we put in Drupal. There's a lot of ways we can stumble, and we do. And so now multiply this by many features, right? Because at any given time, we're working on many of these features at the same time. Plus, we do all of that in a single branch. It's called trunk-based development, where all of these patches get committed to, to the main branch, the trunk. And so what happens with this process is that you know, when we set a release date, which we've done multiple times, or you know, milestones, I should say, when all the features aren't ready, we can't meet that milestone. And so we have to move the milestone. Right? And so really what that means is we can only go as fast as our slowest feature, uh, which obviously isn't great. And so now imagine what we did in Drupal 8. We added hundreds of features. And so we have hundreds of these you know, timelines that we're trying to get to a finish line. And all of these are going you know, slower than expected, or most of them go slower than expected. And we need to get all hundreds or 200 of these over the finish line before we can release. It's kind of a bad situation. And in fact, um, you know, that's exactly what we did. And now we're down to just one feature, which is Twig. You know, all of these criticals that I mentioned, they basically come down to you know, Twig and Twig IO escaping and save markup. So we're literally down to the, getting the last feature over the finish line, which is, which is quite exciting. But we really have to stop doing this. You know, like if we, if we don't change the way we work, we will literally kill ourselves. Not just individuals trying to push Drupal over the finish line, but the momentum and the innovation coming out of the project will, will be too slow. And so I'd like to propose, and you know, just a starting point for a bigger discussion, um, is that we change the way we work, that we build, that we use a methodology that accepts the reality, which is humans are really bad at planning. Things happen. Um, it's a complex world. But that we figure out a way to, to do what we do or to do what we have to do in a way that kind of takes it into account. And in fact, there is a, you know, other projects use a system um, that lends itself uh, better to that. And so what they do is they move, um, basically create feature branches for each of the features. And so what you do is, for big features, you build them in a feature branch. And only when the feature is shippable, you merge it into the main branch. Right? And so they're really uh, firm on keeping the main branch shippable. We cannot commit patches that require follow-up to the main branch, because we never get the amount of follow-up right. And so by developing each of the features, in a feature branch, and only merging when they're shippable, we can get to a much more shippable uh, main branch. That doesn't mean we can no longer use our patch-based workflow. You know, people can still submit patches to a feature branch, and feature branches can still accept multiple patches. Right? We can still do the development the way we used to do it. The only difference is that we'll have to merge a feature branch in the main branch whenever we feel it is shippable. And by shippable, I mean we would make a release you know, 
with that stuff in. Like we wouldn't say, well, we have to do these other things before we can release, all right? And so what that allows us to do is to switch to a date-based system or time-based releases or something that is much closer to that. And so the way it works is if the feature is shippable, we merge it in. If a feature isn't ready, we can still release and the feature can go into the next version of Drupal or maybe the version after that. Pretty simple, I think. Um, or at least it sounds simple, but the complexity is in, now we have to manage these you know, merges. And it's you know, pretty complex sometimes if you have all these feature branches and merges, merges become kind of a mess. But I think it's still much better than having to work for three years on fixing all of the bugs. Like even if a merge takes us three weeks, even if a merge takes us six weeks, it's still better than working for three years on fixing all the bugs, right? And there's also things we can do um, to make it a little bit easier. Like we can still break up features. Uh, we can break them up in MVPs. But again, at the end of an MVP, we could merge it in and we could ship it, right? Even if it doesn't mean the feature is complete, uh, it would still be a good idea. I think the other thing we've learned is that you know, with the initiatives in Drupal 8 is that the best initiatives were the ones with a cross-functional team. And so I'd love to see a lot of these features have cross-functional teams because they get the best velocity, but they also get the consistency if one person, you know, can no longer contribute because something changed in his or her life, then the rest of the team can, you know, carry on with the work and the knowledge is being shared. So really encourage us to think about how we can, you know, embrace the notion of teams more. And then I think the role of the, the technical leadership of the core committers will basically, you know, be what they do today, review patches, commit patches to feature branches, but it will also be about orchestrating merges. Like even if something is ready, we may not choose to merge it yet because we want something else to be ready first and, and to get that, merged in, you know, before. And the way we would do it is based on, for, on the one hand, we want to maximize the impact on the project on the next release. We want to merge in great features. On the other hand, we want to minimize the impact of a merge on the developers, right? Because if you merge a feature, um, all of the other feature branches may have to be updated. And so we'll have to get really good at that and, you know, we'll have to learn a, a lot about how that will work for us. But I think by doing this, um, I think we'll be in a much better place. Um, so to sum up this section, you know, we didn't release on time. In fact, we we're you know, many years late, but it wasn't our fault. I really don't think it was any individual's fault. It was really the way we worked. And I think we're gonna fix the way we work. A lot of details to figure out, um, but ideally we would never see this happen again. We would have regular releases and regular innovation coming out of the project. All right. So that was the first part, uh, some of the first questions. On the market position, um, you know, people wonder, you know, can we compete? And typically, I think sort of the, the elephant in the room that I hear when I talk to people is WordPress. You know, they're growing fast. Um, they're moving up the stack, they're adding new features, like they're dabbling with things like field UI uh, and stuff like that. And so in people's mind, the world looks a little bit like this, right? WordPress being huge, uh, you know, Joomla being bigger than Drupal, and then Drupal being the smallest of the three. But I also think we have to move on from that because the reality, I think, looks a little bit more like this, where Drupal is the dominant platform for large and complex websites. You know, Drupal is more powerful for those sites. The things we have, our ability to scale, the content modeling tools that we have, WordPress doesn't have those. They're starting to build those, but we are like literally years and years ahead of them. And that's reflected in, you know, the, you know, in the adoption of Drupal. Obviously, WordPress is very big on the lower end of the market and there is definitely things we can learn from them, right? And I think the key is, the first thing to remember is I don't think it's, 
you know, I think we have to stop comparing Drupal to WordPress because we're so vastly different. You know, we serve different audiences. Um, we're focused on a different size of the market. Uh, but what we can learn from them is that, you know, WordPress has done a great job focusing on the usability of the author, but also the site builder. And we, Drupal, we've done a great job focusing on the developer. Like we've been really focused on the developer. Um, and for a long time, we've, we've tried to change that. Actually, if you go back to my DrupalCon Barcelona slide in 2007, that's eight years ago, what I did is I did this survey and I asked every, um, you know, everybody that wanted to fill out the survey, what do you think we should put in the next version of Drupal? And at the time, there was Drupal 7. And so I looked at all that survey data, and out of that came this notion of the Drupal 7 killer release. Like, what would be the ultimate release? And so it looked a little bit like this. And I suggested at the time that we would spend 70% of our efforts on things related to user experience, site builders, and only 30% um, focused on the developer experience. Um, and so funny enough, today we've actually done all of these things. It took us eight years, but most of these things we've now done. We've put um, custom content types in core. We, Drupal 8 will have a WYSIWYG. Uh, some of the work on BigPipe will give us great performance. Um, views is in core. But then also for the developer stuff, we've also done these things. So it took us eight years, but we finally reached this killer idea uh, with Drupal 7. And one of the things I actually did in Barcelona, it's not on this slide, I had a, you know, forced in another item, which was 11, which is user experience. Um, but really what we've done is we've done all of these things, but then we've done all of these other things as well. <laughs> and, and most of it is for developers, which, which is great. Um, but how can we get better at, you know, getting the user, the user experience right? And I think we really have to start thinking about Drupal as not just as a tool for us developers, but as a tool for site builders, a tool for authors. And we need to spend more time, you know, focusing on these kinds of features. And it's not just a list of features like I had on the slide. No, in fact, we have a lot of these features. It's about making the experience better, making it very easy and seamless for people to use. I think the field UI is a great example of that. Um, you know, we have all these great features that give incredible power to, to our users and to our site builders. They're just too hard to use sometimes. And that was very clear coming out of the usability testing. So I encourage you to go you know, watch Angie's session on that where she will uh, share the results. Um, so then how do we how do, we do that? And you know, I think it's, it's another process thing. You know, we have to let them try it. And so instead of working like this, we should really consider embracing a lot of the best practices that have been around for many years, which is involving these users in the development process. And by, you know, paper testing, making prototypes, doing some user testing along the way, instead of too often we wait until everything is complete to go test it. You know, we did this with, you know, block management and you know, we build all of these things and then we learned that, you know what, it's not actually usable. We have to go rebuild it. <laughs> um, and so we can, we can learn from that and I, I really think we should. And I believe if we do that, we can go after the real opportunity, which is in fact, 80% of the world does not use a CMS. There's all this white space. You know, we worry about competitors, but really the opportunity is to go after all of these sites that don't use a CMS at all. So we need to convince these people, these organizations, that Drupal is the right tool for them. So to sum this up, I actually do believe Drupal is in a very strong position. I think we have some of the best content modeling tools. I think we have some of the best page building tools, although they're a little hard to use. I think we have some of the best developer experience, especially with the stuff we did in Drupal 8. And it's way better than WordPress. It really is but we can still learn from WordPress about how to make the user experience better. So, and also, let's not just focus on WordPress, um, because I think, you know, as you, you saw in the graph, things like Adobe, CQ5, they're, you know, quickly coming up and getting bigger as well. All right. So, 
The third part of the keynote, I want to talk a little bit about um, the technical uh, relevance of, of Drupal and, and you know, what are these frameworks, the JavaScript MVC frameworks or the client-side apps, and um, how should we react to them? How should we think about them? A lot of people ask me, so I imagine it, it's on a lot of people's mind, and it is because, you know, decoupled Drupal or headless Drupal is, is one of the, probably one of the biggest trends or, you know, hottest topics uh, to discuss. All right, so there are big trends. I don't think the trend will be, will be going away. I think it's here to stay, so we need to, you know, we need to adopt accordingly. Before I go there, not everybody may be familiar with these, so I'll try to explain it very quickly, what, what's been happening. Um, so in the early, early days of the web, the way people built websites is by uh, writing HTML. <laughs> and they would write HTML in a browser, uh, in a in notepad or something, and then upload it to the server. The server would serve it to the client, to the browser, right? And so the rendering literally happened with somebody's hands. They would create a layout, put the content in there, you know, all of these things, and just upload it. CMSs came along, and really what changed is that the rendering kind of moved from the desktop to the server. So now people would um, provide content to the server, you know, through a user interface, but they would not write HTML, they would write content, and the server or the CMS would, you know, build a layout, put the content in there, and send it to the client. I think we're all very familiar with that model, because <laughs> that's effectively what Drupal does. And so then now, with these client-side apps, the rendering kind of moved one step further, right? So now it's the, the browser, the app, that's basically building the layout, and it's requesting content from the server. Could be a MongoDB database, and so they do some um, REST APIs to get the content, but the browser will all put it into a layout, um, you know, and push it to the, and, and present it to the, to the client, if you will. All right, so, and this is actually very good because there's a lot of advantages to this model by pushing the rendering to the client. There's a couple of things you can do uh, more easily, and one of them is called optimistic feedback, which you can see on this slide, which um, this is a screenshot of uh, Pinterest. And so what you can see is they kind of send the layouts and sort of the blocks ahead of time, and then the images are filled in in a second step. And they're actually quite smart about it because they kind of sample the pixels, and they come up with their kind of average color of the image. Um, anyway, that's a detail. <laughs> uh, but the idea of optimistic feedback is, is that it's, you know, it's, it's a better experience. It's a faster experience. It's perceived performance um, for, the, uh, for, the, for the visitor of the website. Another example is non-blocking user interfaces, and this is a screenshot of my uh, Facebook page. Uh, maybe a little bit hard to see, but what you can see here is that I can effectively start playing the video while the rest of the page is still loading. You know, see the little, um, whatever it's called, below the video that shows it's still loading? And so this is also pretty powerful because um, the result is that, you know, users within a few milliseconds, they can start reading content and trying to understand what's going on and then more expensive things are being added later on. Um, and last but not least, often these client-side applications have sort of a, an application-like experience. So here's another uh, little screenshot or you know, animated GIF of, of Trello, which is really a website, but it kind of works like an application, right? And so this is the kind of stuff people want. It's not gonna go away, right? Uh, it's great, so we need to figure out a way to to merge these things uh, and to embrace them with Drupal. All right, so let's, talk a bit, let's go back to this architecture. So in the traditional CMS architecture, what happens, and sorry if this is a little repetitive for some of you, I uh, just wanna make sure everybody can follow. Uh, basically, as I said, the CMS sends the layout and the content, basically sends a whole page to the client. So these client-side apps, it's a little bit different first, or typically first, the app builds the layout, and then we'll do multiple or, you know, one or multiple requests to the server to get all of the content. So it may call, 
a MongoDB database on the, on, the, on the server side, get bits and pieces of content back in JSON, and then put, you know, convert them to HTML and put them in the layout and then send them to the client, or something along those lines. All right, so that's, that's cool, but there's a lot of things you lose, right? You lose the editorial tools of Drupal, like the way you have to put the stuff in the MongoDB database may not be that easy. And so this has led to what people call decoupled or headless CMSs, where really instead of sort of MongoDB serving the content to the app, it's really the CMS that's been adjusted to serve content into the app. And so in this model, and, and so Drupal 8 is ready for this, so we have um, uh, a REST contract effectively, and people can use that to retrieve uh, content you know, from within Drupal and to return it as JSON. Um, but typically, in this kind of architecture, the application still builds the layout and will then just pull content from, from Drupal. And, and like one example would be weather.com, one of the biggest websites in the world, in the top 20 websites in the world, and also probably the biggest website in Drupal, um, you know, billions of, of users every month. Uh, they did this, and they use uh, like a Drupal in a decoupled architecture. And what they had to do on the app site, they had to build their own layout manager and they had to rebuild um, you know, block placement. Things that were available in Drupal that they had to redo, like reinvent on the application side. Um, all right, so in general, you know, Drupal 8 will really love apps. We have a REST, RESTful API for pretty much everything in Drupal, including views, which will make it very easy to build these kinds of decoupled application, applications. Um, but, like in the case of weather.com, um, it's not always easy because there's a lot of things you lose. And here are some examples. Um, you know, you, you lose the Drupal toolbar at the top of the page, typically. You, you often lose um, the, the, the layout management and the block placement. We've also spent many, many years perfecting the accessibility of Drupal. And often these things need to be reinvented now. Uh, form validation, there's a lot of things that you lose when you build these applications and it's basically not great. And so this begs the question, can we have our cake and eat it too? Is there a world where we have all of the benefits of Drupal, um, all of your site building tools, faster performance with BigPipe? Because this is the thing I haven't talked about. It's a little bit too much for the, for the keynote, but I'll do a blog post um, probably tomorrow, which goes into much more detail, but BigPipe actually has a performance advantage compared to client-side apps. Um, the way we can cache things on the server based on knowledge that we have that does not exist in the client uh, gives us an advantage. And I'll have a little video in my blog post. Um, but So how can we get all of these benefits of a traditional CMS, uh, but still keep all of these benefits of um, you know, of a, of a client-side app, right? And I think we can, I've called it uh, progressive decoupling or component-based decoupling, and the idea um, is, is a little bit like this. Um, so first, instead of the app building the layout, you know, Drupal sends the layout. That way we can maintain our layout tools. Uh, Drupal will also send a lot of the content, and we, often we can bundle the content with the layout, things which are very cacheable, things that we know are gonna be needed on every page, like maybe a menu, um, we can send along, right? And so Drupal, and with BigPipe, we can actually be smart about it. So what BigPipe does, it sends the layout, and then it will send um, sort of the fast content first, and more exp expensive content it can schedule, if you will, to be sent uh, after. It's a little bit like what you saw in Facebook, right? Where you know, things already appear on the page, but other things come later. Uh, and then the app can still request content as well, you know, after Drupal has sent the content. And so this model, I think, will uh, give us the best of both worlds. Um, the good news is that with Drupal 8, we keep all of these options open. Like you can still build traditional Drupal sites, if you will, with, um, you know, 
our, our built-in theme system, which we've actually improved quite a bit with Twig. So that will be great. On the other side of the extreme, you can feed your Drupal site data, just like in a purely decoupled uh, application. And that's actually great too, because native apps and the likes, that's you know, typically um, what you would use. But I think there's a large amount of situations where you don't want to rebuild everything on the client side, but in fact, you want to keep all of these tools that are in Drupal. And I think that's kind of the progressive decoupled option. And our content modeling tools, our page building tools, all of these things, we're really good at these, we can actually preserve in this world. We're not quite there yet. Um, there's things we can improve. Um, and actually, one of the, the challenges with these kinds of architectures is, typical, uh, is typically the fact that they're using REST and the way these APIs are built. So right now, often you have to do multiple uh, you know, REST calls to get all the data you want. You have to do you know, multiple of these calls. And then you also get often too much data <laughs> or sometimes too little data. Like for example, if you want to use a username and you know, maybe that's all you want is a username, often Drupal will send you the email address and this and that. You don't want all that data. You just want the right amount of data and you want that with the minimal amount of calls because that affects performance, the REST API calls. And then the other challenge is that um, you know, figuring out these APIs and what the, what the re response objects are is a little bit of a challenge too. It's not easy. So um, what we really need, I think the ideal solution would be, as I mentioned, to do a single API call, you know, one request, and then to be able to get exactly the data that you want. Not too much, not too little. And to build those queries with a much better um, you know, developer experience. And in fact, we have that. <laughs> uh, Fubi or Sebastian has been working on this for, for quite, quite some time, has presented about this uh, DrupalCon before. And I really think we should um, you know, pay attention to what he's doing and consider it um, for inclusion in core even. And I'll give you a little bit of a demo. It's called GraphQL. How many of you have heard about GraphQL? All right, not that many people. Um, but I'll show you a video, I'll try to talk about it <laughs> while the video is playing, but it gives you an idea of how this works. So here's the graph IQL UI. It's actually in Drupal. Oh, hold on, I need to restart this video. All right, so this is a Drupal site. It has some nodes or entities or events, all of the Drupal cons. You can see there's a city field, a region, a year, that kind of stuff, right? And so. Now we switch to this UI, which is you know, also in Drupal, and it's basically a query language. You can say, you know, give me, um, you know, give me node three, really, and here's what I want. I want I want you to give me the, the the title field, and so it returns this JSON object. So pretty easy. So you can do more complex things. You can, you know, start with a view and sort of pick it apart. You can say, give me. Let's see what it's going to do. You know, give me all the, all the nodes and return the title. And so you get a list of all the Drupal cons in, you know, on my site. <laughs> and so you may want to say, actually, filter all of these by the ones that were in Europe. So you can apply a very quick filter. And so you can see now it only is returning European Drupal cons. And you can be a little bit more explicit about anything else that you want. And so you do if the returns are of the type entity node conference. Please show me the city, the separate field that you saw in the UI, and also show me the year that event took place. So very easily you can create these queries with a very easy to use tool. It just like, um, it really helps you build the queries. And here you go, all in a JSON uh, format. The other cool thing you can do is you can actually follow references. And this is where you can start to eliminate multiple queries, but you can say, you know, you know use the, the user ID and then follow that down, if you will, in, in the object model, in the Drupal model, and give me the name of that user ID. And so you can see it returned, you know, admin there. And then there's all sorts of other little things you can do. You can like alias the user ID just to make the, the output a little bit nicer to work with. 
for front-end developers, so now it's called author instead of UID. So this is a very quick demo. But it gives you an idea of some of the power of GraphQL and how it actually would be better than REST, uh, in my opinion. Um, so I don't know if, if Sebastian is here. Is he here? I don't see him, but um, if he has a session, go check it out. <laughs> and so really what it does is it takes this you know, REST concept, changes it into GraphQL, and you know, reduces the number of queries. Um, and all of this is actually made possible. And this is another example of why we are ahead of the others. Like this is made possible because of the serialization and the type data in Drupal 8. Now, these are the things you guys have to keep in mind when people compare ourselves with, with other you know, competitors. And in fact, all of this is already in Contrip for Drupal 8. So we can start playing with that today and making it better. And so I think this idea of progressive decoupling and making that better so we can maintain all of the features of Drupal um, and yet leverage all of the advantages of client-side apps. Combined with GraphQL, I really truly believe it puts us way ahead of you know, virtually any other competitor. Um, so I'm very excited at, by, about that and I really do believe we need to keep exploring that um, in uh, you know, future versions of Drupal. All right, so to sum it up, I think fully decoupled is not always the, base, the best solution. In fact, I only think it's the best solution in a very narrow set of use cases. Um, I think progressive decoupling is often a better solution and gives us the best of both worlds. And I do believe that Drupal 8 combined with GraphQL um, is gonna be an ideal platform for building you know, websites and for building apps. I think it's, it's a very exciting place to be for us. Um, so I talked about all of these three things. Um, I think the key takeaways are we have to release Drupal 8. And when we do, I can promise you that the momentum will come back. What's going to happen, there's a lot of evidence from talking to people. Almost everybody that I talk to, they're waiting for Drupal 8. And so we just have to unleash um, that momentum. Fortunately, we're close. We need to move to a more sustainable release process, a more sustainable development process. You know, one that's healthy. Healthy for the project and healthy for the contributors. I think we need to do a better job putting non-coders first to increase our impact. You know, the thing we can learn the most from WordPress. And four, I really believe that Drupal will be a go-to platform for both sites and apps. Um, so I hope you guys are excited about all of that. Um, and then I have one final note. Um, this is more of a thought. Um, but I'm, I've always been pretty excited about the web and the impact that the web can have on the world. Um, how it helps to you know, connect people. Um, so if you think about it, today there is roughly 3.1 billion people online people with the inter that have internet access. And so if you think about the fact that Drupal powers one in 40 websites, it's, we sort of touch every user on the internet. Because everybody that uses more than 40 websites, chances are, or statistically speaking, that person has used Drupal. I thought it was a really, really cool idea um, that Drupal basically touches everybody on the internet. And then in the next few years, the growth is actually quite staggering. So they predict that in the next few years, like 1.8 you know, billion people will come online. New people that don't have internet today. And so the idea that you know, Drupal and Drupal 8 will be able to touch all of these um, you know, is quite special. And uh, makes me very proud to, to be part of this project and to, to have started Drupal, to see that we can have that reach and touch that many people uh, in the world. If you want a little bit more details about everything I talked about, um, go to my blog. You can subscribe to it if you want. But for each of these things, I'll post a longer blog post. Like I'll, I'll do with, you know, maybe even double the amount of information than that I covered in the keynote. So it will be great. 
to continue the conversation or to get a little bit more technical in, in some of it and a little bit more, um, just get a little bit more data. Um, so feel free to do that. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Awesome. All right. Yeah, Mike. <laughs> Thank you, Dries. So we have about 10 minutes for Q&A. Had a lot of great feedback come in. Okay. Um, some nice compliments on the design. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's not me. <laughs> so, another talent. Uh, yeah. Um, so where do you think the most feedback from your talk, what, what topic? Because huh. there was one that was overwhelmingly really? more questions about th than everything else. I don't else. know. I have no idea. Drupal 8 or future Drupal core development workflow. Oh, really? Awesome. Right. That's good. So, yeah. you know, we ha I, I wrote down probably about six um, questions, so I'll pop a few of them okay. at a time and we'll see how it goes. Um, so you mentioned we're going to change the way we work after D8 ships. Right. Um, so does this mean that we need, to we need to figure out this new process before we move past 8.0? Uh, no, I mean, it would be good to do, I mean, we're going to actually try and spend some time on this this week mm -hmm. to figure out some more details. I mean, we don't have to, you know, it, it only becomes relevant once we decide to build building new features, you know, after Drupal 8 is released. So um, the sooner we figure it out, you know, the better in a right. way, but, um, we can, we can afford to take the time to, to figure out how we're going to do it. All right. um, I would say ideally we figure it out by the time Drupal 8.0.0 ships. Fair enough. All right. So I'm going to apologize in advance for butchering some of these names. Um, so a couple of questions that came in. Um, Julian Dubriel, I believe. Uh, does changing the approach of releasing Drupal and MVPs and shippable features means Drupal will stay in version 8 indefinitely? Will there will there'll be a Drupal 9 yeah, at some will. point? Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it, you know, it could be because you know, it should allow us to add more features to Drupal 8 as we go. Mm -hmm. um, but the one thing that we committed to is that we would uh, maintain backwards compatibility, right? And so in an ideal world where we can add a lot of features to Drupal 8 you know, for all of the min minor versions of Drupal, um, you know, a Drupal 9 version, and actually this, we discussed this already a little bit with, you know, Catch and Alex and Angie and Jess, um, that technically Drupal 9 could be like the last Drupal 8 version where we just remove the layers of backwards compatibility. Um, so it, it, it could be close to that. Okay. But we're, there's still gonna be, we're still gonna need these points where we remove, you know, a lot of the backward compatibility just so we don't slow down the system and you know, we clean up some of the code. Um, but it, I, I guess the short version is yes, hopefully we'll see more continuous innovation where you know, fairly big you know, features will be added to Drupal 8 along the way. Um, can we add the ability to fork core? <laughs> uh, empower developers to create their own feature initiatives and then merge them back in. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I think that's one of the open questions like, um, you know, how many of these feature branches right. are, are there going to be know, official feature branches and then unofficial feature branches? Can anybody start a feature branch? Yeah, so we don't know yet. Right. Um, however, I will say that I'm pretty passionate about sort of keeping this idea of, uh, you know, permissionless innovation where anyone can say, oh, I'm going to, you know, add this, you know, I'm going to try and get this feature into the next version of Drupal. Like, I think some of the best things that happen to Drupal is, is exactly that like the unexpected, unplanned features. And so the big question is how can we, how can we keep that in our, in our process, right? So that these unexpected things that are great can happen. Uh, at the same time, it's not too hard to imagine that having 200 of these feature branches is gonna be a little bit unwieldy and that we may have to, you know, we may have to have a process that says, all right, let, let's work on these things now. Maybe let's wait for this feature to get started so we kind of, not complicate our lives too much. But again, a lot of these details we have to figure out. Um, right. I think we'll, what we'll do is we'll think about them, we'll try to document them, we'll solicit feedback from the community, but a lot of it will be learning as we go and adjusting the process as we go. So we'll, what you should expect us to see do is kind of ease into it, maybe a little bit more restrictive mm -hmm. than you may like, but then you know, it's gonna open it up more and more as we get our sea legs, if you will, and we know exactly how, how things will 
will, uh, will work. So. so I think this question is going to have a similar answer, but I'm okay. going to ask anyway, because it popped into my head as you were talking, and then somebody asked it on Twitter, and it got retweeted a bunch of times. Um, I believe the original poster was Ashish Takur. Again, sorry if I butchered your name. Uh, Feature-based branching sounds cool, but current issues in Drupal.org, Git infrastructure is not fit for that. Do we shift to GitHub or a similar model? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. <laughs> um, it's a very complex question as well. Um, there's so many things that we use that do not exist in GitHub. Um, so I, I don't think of an answer for that, but it seems, um, you know, I think it's safe to say that feature branches will not be the trigger to, the only trigger. If, if we do decide to move to GitHub, it will be much more holistic mm. approach to it. I think for now we're pretty set on staying, you know, with, with D2O. Um, Donna Benjamin asks, uh, new topic here. So we need to recognize non-coders in the right. community as first-class citizens. Um, we've kind of started moving in that direction with updates to the uh, Drupal.org profile pages, mm -hmm. but how do we go further? What, what are the next steps in making sure that people who don't code but contribute you know, right. huge amounts of time right. are considered you know, first-class citizens? Yeah, we have some, I, I totally agree with Donna, first of all, I, 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 you know, yes, we have to recognize all of the contributors, you know, people that write documentation, people that you know, sponsor events, people, I mean, whatever it is they do, uh, I think we need to, to figure out how can we best recognize that. Um, a lot of the, and, and so far actually we've, we've been rolling out the credit system that I talked about last year, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, that's actually in place. We're still kind of rolling out where these credits are being, you know, shown. Um, but they're still only focused on people that contribute code. And, you know, that, in a way that's a great thing. Like, you know, it's a good first step and it, it's okay to make incremental improvements. I mean, we can't expect to kind of roll out a system big bang style that mm -hmm. incorporates every single kinds of, of contributor. But what's important now is that we keep iterating, that we keep adding these other ways of, of recognizing contributions. Um, how exactly we're gonna do that, um, you know, I don't know right now. I would have to talk to the Drupal Association about that because they're actually building all of these things. Um, but yeah. We should do that. <laughs> okay. Um, so a couple of months ago, I believe, Larry Garfield published a blog post, actually back in July, I have here in my notes, arguing that we should focus Drupal core more um, to possibly stop trying to be all things to all people. I think you used like the peanut butter analogy, we're right. spreading ourselves too thin. Right. Um, so for instance, you know, maybe we should focus on the structured content capabilities of Drupal as a differentiator. Right. And that if your site needs structured content, you should be looking at Drupal. Right. Um, if we do something, if we do, I don't want to say officially, focus Drupal more, right. how do we, you know, that it means we're going to deprioritize right. other parts of the market. H how do we deal with that? How do we handle that? Yeah. Um. Again, great question. Not an easy answer. There's definitely no like you know. I have some easy answer. ones coming up. So. <laughs> um, but I, but I do think we you know we 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 focus Drupal um, you know through the initiatives and stuff. You know I think we have brought a focus to the table. Um, it's not and, official though. It's not in the mission statement. It's and not in the mission statement. Right. No, but it's. I mean, you know, App Apple's mission statement is build great products. I mean, they don't say what feature they're going to add to sure. the next iPhone either, right? So. Um, but you know, based on what I talked about today, clearly what I'm what I'm pushing for is is you know recognizing the content modeling tools, um, you know recognizing that Drupal can be great for multi-channel publishing, recognizing that we can build multiple heads to Drupal, um, and so you know I, th I think we're really good at that, you know. So I explained today, and it, and I also suggested that we even need to get better at that. I'm not saying that's the only thing we have to focus on. There's going to be other things that we need to focus on as well, you know, like user experience. But other than the things in the keynote, there's, there's going to be other things. Um, but yeah, I think saying no to things will, will be very helpful. All right. um, so with the, again, it's going to be a process to figure out what exactly we're going to you know, right. focus on. But you know. All right, we're running low on time, so I have two quick ones for okay. you. Um, this one uh, came in from Twitter via Mike Herschel. If you had a time machine, yeah. and can go back to, I looked up the date, March 11th, 2011, when the Drupal 8 
development branch opened, if you could go back in time, what advice would you give yourself about the Drupal 8 development cycle? Huh. Um, well, if I knew what I knew today, I would probably push the feature branching, um, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, I think it would, that, would, that would have been great. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, so last one, I'm, I'm picking this one just because uh, you know, we honored Kathy earlier with the award, and now I just want to see your head explode. Um, we had a, someone on Twitter, Jason Mark, comment, I tried to join the sprint yesterday and told no one needs a UI person. How do I help? Yeah. So I think the answer right. was just to go find Kathy, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we definitely need a lot of UI people. Um, we do, yeah, that's what we need the most, I would say, so. All right, well, yeah. thank you very much for your time. Yeah, you're welcome, thank you. Um, and I believe Jam is going to lead us, there he is right there, to the group photo.